couple of lectures. So, like I said, when we were going through the stuff about estimations and comparisons, it was just a number of lectures to have at the start of the course like this to give you a quick introduction into statistics and why it's important for ecology. Yeah? How did it... Did you find that useful? Yeah? Was it helpful? Was Did anybody download or use the online files? Try those. Don't all answer at once. At least one person. That's okay. It was worth my while doing it then. They'll stay in D2L, so you can go back and use them for, revision, for revising this material to, to get a better, a better grasp on it, a better understanding of it, closer to exams and things like that. Today, I'm ready for the, the rest of the course, or at least the rest of my components of the course. We're going to shift our focus to some bigger picture stuff. We'll be talking about statistics. We're really looking at populations. What's, what's a trait characteristic for population for a population? Is population one different to population two? When we're talking about ecology and evolution, we're dealing really at the level of the individual. Remember, evolution works at the individual level. Which individual is more likely to succeed? Which individual is less likely to, su to succeed? We'll talk a little bit about communities later on. Um, Professor Peak, towards the end of the course, is going to talk a lot more about that. But for the next three or four or five or six lectures, anyway, we're going to talk more about big systems and more about the, the overall factors that sort of drive and determine ecology and what, what types of traits we see in a particular region. Remember at the, in the introductory lecture, we talked about ecology being the interactions between organisms and their environment. We will talk quite a bit of later on a lot about interactions between organisms, how organisms interact with each other, predators, prey, things like that. But for the moment, we're going to focus on this third component of the environment. Remember, when we're talking about ecology, we have you know, in the environment there's a, an abiotic component and a biotic component. And the biotic component is we could classify it as all the organisms and how they're interacting. The abiotic component is anything else. It's the, the actual environment that this these interactions are taking place in, the environment that species are, are adapted to, that they get their, their energy and their resources from. And there's four main components in this, four components that determine really what type of species we find in an area. Climate, air, water, soil. And we're going to go through each of these sort of in sequence over the next series of lectures. And when I talk about them, we talk about them, well, not as static things, but almost as a, almost in stasis, as this is just how it is. But we have to remember that organisms are constantly changing, constantly evolving. There's new species arriving into an area, there's different populations going through a boom and a bust cycle. This is determining the type of traits that we see within, within a population. Think of the examples we showed of beak size and finches, how that changed associated with changes in the environment, and then ultimately changes in the availability of prey, the availability of different types of seeds. The species are also feeding back and also influencing their, their own environment. But the environments themselves are changing. And we're going to talk in, in this lecture, we're going to really focus on climate. And we'll talk about small scales or small temporal ranges, changes in climate or changes in weather, and then also longer term changes. A quick definition to start with. Climate, 
and weather are two separate things. We have daily weather forecasts, we don't have daily climate forecasts. Weather is short term what it's like today. Today it's, it's particularly nice and sunny, or it's rainier than we, it's wetter than we expected, or it's colder than we expected. Climate is a longer term process that incorporates all of this short scale variability. So this is a plot from some NOAA data on the, from the Great Lakes. And this is surface water temperature. Um, it's either pooled across the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario. And we see we go from January, February, March through the summer, back into winter again. Water temperature goes from just above freezing up to just above 20 and back down again. Within this, year on year, there's variability. There's variation. We've got a warm day or a cold day. We've got even a warm year or a cold year. This level of variability, whether it's colder in 2012 than it was in 2014, we can see that as a weather trend. The overall trend of a system that is just above freezing in winter, 20 degrees in summer, that's climate. That's the, the broader the broader pattern. And when we talk about climate, that's the the level of variability that we're that we're particularly interested in and we're talking about. And climate is probably the main driver of of ecology. Well of ecology of what types of species we see in a different area. As we'll see in this and subsequent lectures, climate is associated with both temperature and moisture availability, temperature and precipitation. And those two things are interlinked. And depending on the climate in a different area, that will determine the landscape, it will determine what type of plants can live in an area, and what type of plants can live in an area, will determine what type of animal species can live in an area. Sorry, two, girl, two legs at the back, halfway, two thirds of the way back. If you could just keep it till after the lecture, okay? We'll see in subsequent lectures how there are regional variants. A particular area is associated with, not even a particular area, a series of areas that are associated with a particular type of climate, particular type of temperature, rainfall regime, are associated with particular types of flora and fauna. They're not in the same area, they're not the same species, but they're different species that have evolved to have similar traits because they live in a similar type of environment. In, on, on the Earth, so this is a, this, as we show, hopefully now the map of the Earth, color-coded to reflect the net radiation. The amount of solar radiation received, or that hits an area, <coughs> minus the amount that it reflects back. <coughs> and this varies across the globe. The poles receive far less solar radiation <coughs> than the equatorial areas. It also varies seasonally, and this sort of, there's an interaction between the spatial and the temporal variability. You can take here this blue line, which represents, represents the equator, January, February, March, through to December, the amount of solar radiation, pretty stable. It's receiving pretty much the same amount of sunlight every month of the year. As we move further north, through 30, 60, and ultimately 90 degrees latitude, this trend changes. Where we, if we move right, if we take that extreme example right at the poles, during winter, we've got 24 hour darkness, there's no sunlight. During summer, 24 hour sunlight, no darkness. So, depending where you are on the Earth, the amount of solar radiation you receive will vary. Why is it? 
there's two, two, two key factors, and sort of down to simple geometry, simple geometry of the Earth and where we get our energy from. First of all, if we're at the equator or up at a higher latitude, across the same area when the sun's rays hit, hit the Earth straight on, across the same area, that amount of radiation will either hit a small area or be dispersed across a much wider area. So we've got that amount of energy, that amount of radiation, that amount of solar energy is either on and there or spread over that much wider area. So we're diluting the, the solar radiation. Also further north, it can't really come out, doesn't come out very well here, which is clear in the book. This sort of grey band here represents the atmosphere. And as the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, the sun gets absorbed. We've seen the moon gets absorbed by water molecules, carbon molecules, different gases. And so higher latitudes pass through more atmosphere, more of the energy is absorbed before it gets to the Earth's surface. In addition, the Earth. Its axis, the Earth's axis is tilted relative to its, um, relative to its position with the sun. It's tilted to 20, at 23.5 degrees. And this means that as we do a, an annual rotation around the sun, where we are on the Earth, on this tilted axis, will determine how much sunlight we receive. So put yourself up here in the northern latitude, summer solstice. As the Earth spins, you're radiated for 24 hours a day. At the autumnal and the, the vernal equinox, everywhere on the Earth, day, daylight or day length and night length is equal. And as we move then into, into winter, again our northern latitude here, is in 24 hour darkness due to the, the, the angular tilt on the Earth, or the axial tilt on the Earth. So, simply by our, our rotation or our, by, by the geometry of our planet, we get this variation in the amount of radiation received by at an area. In addition, the radiation that comes into the Earth, so the Earth is warmed by, by solar radiation, but it's a little bit more complex than that. As incoming in, shortwave radiation comes in, from the sun, so solar radiation and shortwave radiation, that heats the Earth. As the Earth heats, it gives off long wave radiation. <coughs> At each step, the atmosphere contains greenhouse gases, which absorb long-wave radiation and emit long-wave radiation back down to the Earth. These greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, these things like, like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, naturally occurring gases. If we didn't have these, if we didn't have that, that atmos atmosphere containing greenhouse gases, Life could not exist on Earth. This is data from this is NASA data from, from Mars, looking at Mars is no atmosphere, looking at daily daily changes in air and ground surface temperature. And within a 24 hour period, we get a range, of, this is in Fahrenheit because it's NASA, from to over 30 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Extremely cold, extremely high annual or de daily variation because there's no, you can think of it as, a, as, a, as an insulating blanket, there's no insulating layer there to regulate the, <coughs> the solar radiation. So this, this phenomenon is what allows life to exist on Earth. It 
it's also something that when people talk about, about climate change and human force climate change, it's by inf it's influencing this phenomenon by producing more greenhouse gases. Is the activity is what human is human activity that's changing the temperature. This is some data from from IPCC reports, subsequently used in IPCC reports, and it's estimated global or northern hemisphere temperatures from the year 1000 for the last 1000 years. The red line up here is data that we have measurements for. <coughs> the older data in the blue lines is data that we're just, it's developed from proxy records. We don't actually have good temperature measurements going back beyond below, before the 1800s. But you see where we do have me measured data and our instrumental data and proxy data, the overlap between them is very, very good. So we've got some degree of confidence in our estimated previous history, or our estimates of previous temperatures. But also note that this gray bar, as we go back in time, we've got a big error bar on our, on our estimates. Yeah, so like we talked about in the in the statistics component, we've got a mean value here, sort of predictions from multiple different sources of what the temperature was, some degree of error on that, and also depending on the statistical method we've used, this could be our 90% confidence in this. <laughs> yeah, so we're 90% certain the mean value is something, but the not, we're up, we're 90% confident it's between here and here. It's quite noisy, yeah? It could be, we could have a line that goes like, hmm, like that. <coughs> so that's just the limitation of the science. But this is what, this is what I'm, the reason I'm showing that is really because this is what we talked about in statistics applied to real data. So climate is the climate of the temperature, northern hemisphere temperature, is going through a massive increase in the last 50 to 100 years. Increasing, or that the rate of this increase is getting faster and is increasing every year. So we're in the last what 50 years, people have been putting questions trying to work out what is driving this. What's the main cause for this climate change? And there's a hypothesis that it was related to greenhouse gases, notably CO2 that people were, were emitting. And this is some data here that similarly has, if we go back to 1900, and we've got data from, from ice cores. So we've got good temperature data, not average temperature data, back to 1900. Lots of measurements, so pretty, data's pretty robust. We've got CO2 values of data from either measured at Mauna Loa, in, in Hawaii, or from ice cores taken in Greenland. And again, you can see where they overlap around. So one of these is the, the Antarctic data, the older data in green, newer data in, from Mauna Loa in blue. Where we have data for both of those, they, they support each other very well. So again, we can be confident in our, in our previous predictions. And we see a very nice relationship, depending, depending how you look at this, a very nice relationship between the amount of CO2 in the environment and global temperature. And this is part of the data set that is responsible for the current agreement, say, that climate that one climate is changing and two is being driven by human emissions of greenhouse gases. Notably, things like methane, like CO2. Other people have looked at this data and said, no, look, it doesn't match up at all. You've got areas here where temperature was decreasing, even though CO2 was increasing. You've got a lot more variability in one than the other. The actual older data is less precise, less confident. It can't be CO2. It's not CO2. And to a degree, they're right. It's not that it's not CO2, it's not just CO2. 
There's lots of other things as well as greenhouse gases, which are influencing the environment. We can look at short-term and longer-term natural cycling events in global, global climate. El Nino occurs, we're building up into another one at, this, at the moment, but quite irregular, but typically in the region around about five to six years. There's also Milankovitch warming and cooling cycles, which occur over a much longer time frame. We've got variants in the amount of solar radiation received by the sun on any one year. Shoot. Hit me that back here. Okay. We've also got what's known as the Albedo effect. And that's essentially Albedo saying that the, the, the Albedo is the fraction of incoming radiation which is reflected. So some radiation, we get, we receive radiation, some of it's absorbed, some of it's reflected back out. It's highest at the poles, lowest, certainly over the ocean. Any idea of why? Yep, exactly, yep. It's, it's white, the, land, the landscape here is white, it's reflecting more sunlight. Also, clouds, and emissions, human emissions, not, not like industrial emissions, let's say, not human emissions, also have a thing on moisture, are white, increased reflection, increase the albedo. So when we want to model this, when we want to understand what exactly is driving climate change, we need to have a lot, we need to have very complex models that incorporate all of these different characteristics and all of these potentially, potentially influencing traits. And with that, we can then start to make stronger predictions over what are the actual drivers of climate change. And this is a plot of essentially of variation in a lot of these drivers. Okay? We've got well mixed greenhouse over. From 1880 to 2000, the, the relative forcing, the relative influence of these different drivers on climate, or on relative to themselves. So we can see that greenhouse gases have increased. Solar, uh, the amount of ozone has slowly increased, but not by, not, by, not by much. The solar radiance has increased somewhat, but goes through these sort of long term <coughs> cycles. Land use has changed, the amount of Albedo has changed. We can take all of this information, put it into a, a very large and complex model, and, and test how that model explains temperature. How well does this model explain changes in global temperature? And what we see here, we've got a plot of this net forcing plotted in blue. And the GISS temperature, which is set over here, what we're looking at in this value here, in this temperature graph, and typically whenever you see climate data presented, it won't be raw values. It will be how different is it from the norm. And typically for the norm, we say for climate science, it's mean global annual temperature between 1960 and 1990 got a large 30-year period, and how do temperatures vary relative to that, to that time? So here we can say variation in temperature in red relative to that time is increasing, but highly variable year on year. Net forcing, certainly where we have good data, there's a much stronger link. There's a very, very closer relationship between the two. I put in, I sort of highlighted in one of the slides. So some of this data, I'm not a big fan of <coughs> sending people to websites and blogs and things like that to get more info, to get more information. Typically, certainly at your level, when you're actual students in university, you should be going to the raw literature, the, the, the primary literature, and getting your information from that. But because this is a, an overview. I would suggest, and I'll, I'll put a link in D2L, there's an excellent website called Skeptical Science, Oops. and it's a 
and it's developed, it's been developed all the way for maybe 10 years now by a assistant professor at a university in the US. I can't remember. His name's John Cook. He's a climate scientist. He's actually an assistant professor in climate change communication. So he knows what he's talking about, he knows the science, and he does an extremely good job of presenting it in an accessible fashion. So if you want to learn more about this, Skeptical Science is a really good resource to use. So, that's all I'm going to say about climate change for now. Well, maybe, depending on the course goes, we might try and fit half a lecture in towards the end on ecological response to climate change. If, in, if the climate changes and as the climate warms, what do we see in biotic communities as a response to that? But for now, we still want to focus on what's the cause of climate in different, different parts of the globe. So we've got, in terms of radiation, a net gain in the equatorial region and a net loss in the poles. They're losing so what, what energy they receive, a, large, a very large proportion of it is reflected out. So there's a, a, a variance, a, a variance, a gradient here in what should be temperature. If radiation is the sole driver of, of temperature, this should be reflected a very, very strong temperature gradient. But what we see in, in reality is that the movement of, of air, and particularly of moisture, through that, around the planet serves to transport this hot, the hottest air towards the poles. And similarly, cooler air moves back down towards the equator. So we can see as solar radiation hits the oceans, hits the tropics, it keeps the air up, warm air rises, cool air moves in to take its place, and we get these currents, these cells of or these trends of air airflow away from the equator towards the poles, distributing temperature. Again, it's not quite as simple as that. There's that's, that, that's the, the crux of what's happening. But as air temperature, so as air, warm air rises, moves towards the poles, when it gets to around about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, it hits an area of high pressure, high air pressure. And that forces the warm air down, back down towards, towards the earth. However, it's still warmer, it still continues to move north, moves towards the poles, and it reaches, hits this polar cell, and moves back up above it. So we've got moving from the, from, from the equator to the pole, the air moves to three separate cells at, the, at, the, at the each, each time. Happy cell, feral cell, and polar cell, but cell in, the, in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. In part, that's sort of where, where that's driven, and it's where the, the majority of that evaporation is occurring. Yeah. It gets a little bit more complicated again because these aren't just moving through static space as this bubble of air, as this current of air is brought up from the equator, rises north, and starts to fall back down again. The environment that it's on <coughs> is spinning all the time. The Earth continues to spin. So as this moves up, it gets deflected. Again, in the upper, it gets deflected as, as the Earth moves. So it's coming up and it's getting deflected. Depending on which way it's moving from the equator, or it's from Air moving away from the equator is deflected to the east. Air moving towards the equator is deflected to the west because of the, the rotation on the Earth. 
We combine these two things, the fact that the air is moving from south to north, let's just keep, keep with the northern hemisphere for the moment, as the air moves from south to north, it's moving north, it's also getting deflected. We move into the feral cell as it's moving from like, back towards the equator, it's getting deflected in the opposite direction. These two things lead to what we class, what we term as the trade wind, the main distribute the main forces distributing air around the globe. As the air moves, it's also bringing the moisture with it. The moisture in and water, as we see in subsequent lectures, is a far better holder, far better conductor of, of heat than air. So as the air moves and brings the moisture with it, it's moving, it's distributing temperature, or distributing heat around the planet. It's also responsible for the main precipitation regime that we see across the planet. We put ourselves here on the equator, the, the hottest part of the globe. So. As the air is <coughs> heated, it's absorbing lots and lots of moisture. As it starts to rise, it condenses, and we get extremely high levels of rainfall around, uh, around in the equatorial area. As we get to around about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, that air is getting brought back down by that high pressure zone, it's coming back down to Earth. But it's lost all its moisture as, as it rolls. So at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we have two arid regions. Because the majority of the air that's in these areas has very, very low amounts of moisture. same time, the air is moving. So these are, this is a plot of, of, of ocean currents. But if you were to superimpose a plot of the actual trade winds and the movement of those different cells over that, you'll see a very, very similar trend. <coughs> what that's showing is that one of the things that, the, that drives ocean currents is the movement of the air masses above them. So as the air Say here, up to us, is moving up through the, the North, North Atlantic Drift. It's pushing warm water north with it. And again, we're seeing the same, have, it's having the same role. It's redistributing heat from the tropics further north. And this is one of the reasons that we can have areas that have a very similar latitude can have extremely different climates. This is a typical winter's day in Ireland, where I'm from. We have a cold, a cold day in winter. So this is illustrated sort of by the blue line. It's a sort of annual range in max to mean temperatures, January through summer through December. Cold day is about two or three degrees. So it sounds nice in the middle of a New Brunswick winter. But a very warm day in midsummer is probably around about 17 or 18 degrees. Not so, not so hot. We take that to, to New Brunswick, which is similar-ish latitude. Ireland actually is 10 degrees higher, five, five, six degrees higher than New Brunswick. But in terms of our latitude, in terms of the amount of solar radiation we receive, it's really similar. But the climate is very, very different. Winter's day can range from minus five, minus 10, minus 15. Summer's day, easily into plus 30. We're receiving, in New Brunswick, we've got more of a continental influence in the climate. Ireland has got a far more, we we call it maritime here, we'll see, we'll see in a minute, but Ireland receives a lot more of this direct warm, moist air coming up the North Atlantic Drift. Keeps our summers cool, keeps our winters mild. We move right into the continent, 
where there's no, or continental America, no continental Canada, but Manitoba, no influence here from, from the ocean currents, from the oceans moving that heat. Winter day, minus 20, minus 20, minus 15. Summer, again, warm, dry, dry area. If we were looking solely at the effect of radiation, each of these areas should have an almost identical climate, should have an almost identical summer maximum or winter minimum. But they don't. There's a massive contrast because of where they are geographically in relation to the ocean and the way that the oceans are distributing heat around the Earth. Climate is also influenced on a more local scale. We've talked so far really about big global patterns, but we can have more localized, regional effects. One of these is termed the rain shadow effect. So here at the, at the edge of an ocean, we have water or air carrying a moisture rich air. It's at the end, edge of an ocean, moving towards towards the land. It's forced upwards to get over the to get over the mountain range. As it for as it's forced upwards, the water condenses. We get a lot of precipitation, and on the far side of the mountain range, the air is dry. All the moisture has been released through condensation on on the windward shore on the windward side, on the, on the leeward side, on the, the opposite side, you've got a dry air. And that's why Vancouver and Calgary have such incredibly different climates. We see this right the way down the west coast of North America and, and South America as well. Wherever we have that system of, particularly if we have a, a large water or a large water body, you get a lot of precipitation. This works on a really small scale, as well as a really large scale. If you have a, a hill or a mountain range, the environment on one side will be very different, and it can be very different to the environment on the other side, once you have prevailing winds that are typically blowing in one direction. There's also a lake effect. So if we were, in this instance, we're not, there's no mountain body between, and I'll mention range, between the land and the water. But because of the, the properties of land and water, the, the climate varies. The land warms much quicker than the water, develops in a low pressure area. That air rises, cold air off the lake floods in. Typically, so if you're at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a lake side during the summer's day, you'll feel that cool breeze coming in off the water during the day. At night time, the opposite occurs. Water, as we see in later lectures, cools far, much, much slower than, than, it, or than, than land. So during land, or during the night, sorry, the land is cooler, the water is warmer, the air that's above the land floods out over the water. So you get, at night time, you can get a breeze blowing, blowing out to the lake. There's a, there's a word for it, I'm not too sure what it is. All of these characteristics, all of these traits in, in the environment, determine what type of plants can live in an area. Is it a, an area like a, a similar latitude, like, like Ireland, that we've got plants that can't, extract, can't live in extreme cold, can't cope with being covered in snow for three, four, 17 months a year, however long it takes. Do we, we have extreme variations in, in climate or in the, the plant community on one side of the Rockies to the other side because the, the latitude is the same, but the amount of precipitation they receive is entirely different. 
We can go right the way around the globe and identify different regions that have a particular climate type. And typically, they will be associated with a particular type of flora and fauna. And this allows, whoops, this allows us to then identify, or we, we can and we do, identify areas based on their flora and fauna. So this is sort of maps of Canada. Different areas are associated with a particular type of climate, and they're associated, therefore, with a particular type of flora and fauna. In New Brunswick, we fall into the Atlantic Maritime Ecozone. Fredericton is in what's termed as a maritime lowland. And we can go to different areas that have these same climate traits and expect that they will have similar flora and fauna. So we can use that when we want to look at management of an area, when we want to identify what species we think will be in an area, if we want to identify which species will be in an area if the climate increases by one or two degrees. If we want to say, okay, well, at the moment we've got lots of Atlantic salmon all along here, and these are very important to our economy, but we know that the thermal threshold for Atlantic salmon is around about 32 degrees. If water temperature here is going to increase by 2 degrees over the next 50 years, what's the future for Atlantic salmon in this region? What species are we likely to see that could come in? And those different water conditions will be better for, for different types of species. We can understand what, how the, it allows us to understand how the climate is related to the ecology of the region, it's related to the flora and fauna of the region. In the next lecture, we're going to move on and talk a bit more about water, the particular traits of, uh, of, of water as, as an environment. <coughs>